This is a game by Bobby Fischer. Uh, he played in 1960 against Max Uwe. Um, the opening was the Karakan defense, and White went for the Pano attack. In this position, um, Black has a couple of choices. He can either play e6 and uh, make the center more solid and and develop the king side first by something like bishop to e7 and then castle. Or, as in this game, he can play knight to c6. And uh, by doing this, he can keep the options for the bishop open. And uh, the bishop is not being shut down yet. And after knight to f3, the bishop comes out. The only downside to that is that uh, this somewhat weakens the b7 pawn and also the d5 pawn is still not being sufficiently protected. So according to theory, uh, white takes on d5 and then puts the pressure on both uh, d7 and d5. Uh, black exchanges on f3 and by doing so he weakens um, white's pawn structure here. He then has to support this knight, so e6 is uh, the main line. White takes on uh, b7 and uh, black counters by taking on d4. He now threatens to give a fork on c2, maybe take on f3. Um, so this knight is strong here, but at the same time black skin is somewhat exposed. Um, and um, the king side is not developed still. And this will actually be the problem for black throughout the whole game. White um, attacks the king, and here there's an important uh, subtlety. Uh, white uh, does not just take the the knight first. Instead, um, he forces black to, to move the king first with queen to c6. And now if, say, queen to d7, then the rook falls. So this is not good. Instead, uh, black plays king to e7, and only now white takes the, uh, the knight. Uh, at the time, um, the the main line here was knight to c3, and this is what Uwe played in this game. Um, right now, the main line has become queen to d7, and the the play can continue as follows: it takes queen, takes bishop, check. And in this typical position, um, white basically attacks of black's weaknesses and um, black is struggling to, to mobilize his pieces and um, once he does he will also try to attack white's weak pawns on the king side so it can continue like this this is all theory and here white is invading on the e-file and black goes just on time rook to c4 and with this he is going to come to h4 and start to attack all of white's pawns. So basically the position is roughly equal although I think it's more fun to play this as white. Um, typical for this line is that white has a bunch of weaknesses and uh, he has better development so if black manages to get his pieces out on time he'll be okay but it's often a challenge. In the game after knight to c3, it may seem that white gets just an extra pawn weakness. But what turns out is that um, by virtue of the pawn moving from b2 to c3, white gets an extra open file. And after queen d7, white goes rook b1. Now the rook will also be coming into b7 at some point, just being very active on the b file. Um, so black is kind of concerned about um, the fact that the rook may have to be 7 and he decided to quickly transfer the rook to d7. Uh, but it turns out that this took two moves and uh, the king side in the meantime was staying undeveloped. Um, so probably a better idea here was to immediately take on b5 and then um, even though white does come to the stone rank, it's it's not that bad, and black can actually continue to fight on here, and um, at least black is safely defending the spawn, 
and he should be able to at some point develop even though um, it's not so good here for him either it's still a pretty dangerous position for black um, and it's also interesting that this Fisher wrote about this position that uh, it's going to be really hard for chess computers to evaluate this position correctly and judge that um, the fact that white pieces are so active is more important than, than the pawn weaknesses throughout the board that he has. And it's interesting that computers still think that this position is quite fine for black. Uh, but actually, if you look at the stats of how human players do here and from this position, they can barely score 10% as black, which is just really bad. Um, so this, this position is still much more fun to play as white. So in the game, black played um, rook to d8, and um, white just continues with his development. Black has to trade queens, and by doing so, he just gives white more tempi because now the rook is more active on b5. Um, he now protects the pawn. It turns out that this pawn is not going to be saved anyway, and so maybe it was worth um, just trying to do something like rook to d5 and say after capture, capture if the bishop uh, takes on a7 then at least black gets to play king to d7 and now his pieces can come out and maybe he gets some counter play. Anyway, um, in the game he went rook to d7 which is at least consistent because that was the plan uh, behind rook d8 and now um, after king e2, white wants to bring this rook into the game. That's the point of this move. Black has to solve his problem. How to get these pieces out into the game. Um, black played um, pawn to f6. The point of which is to move the king to 7 and then get the bishop out. It was also possible to play g6. It was an interesting idea. Um, and the bishop could come out to g7 and the rook could enter the game as well. But of course white can sort of prevent this for the time being and keep the initiative. After f6, Fischer played a very important move. He noticed that um, of all of black's pieces, um, two are really not doing anything, and one is kind of holding everything together. And um, for white, uh, the opposite applies. These two pieces are very active. The rook in h1 is doing anything. So he trades off his least active piece for black's most important defensive piece. So he goes rook to d1. And this basically decides the game pretty much. Uh, so the threat is to capture on d7 and then maybe rook b7. So black captured. And now um, again he tries to get this, this bishop into the game. Now it would be a really big mistake for white to just go after the pawn. Again, uh, of course, Fisher understands this and he doesn't do that. He sees that um, after bishop takes, white wins a pawn, but he lets all of black's pieces come out. And some say so after something like this, black is down a pawn, but white's pawns are very weak. And there's little material left on the board, so it would be really hard to win from here. After rook b8, however, the pieces are completely tied down along the 8th rank. White's going to win this pawn and just easily convert the advantage. And this is what happens. He finally takes the pawn. Again, it's a struggle for black to get these pieces untangled, so he hopes to play bishop to g7. The pawn advances, and it only has several um, squares left before it queens, so it, it runs very fast. Um, white could here have traded rooks and just go into the bishop endgame, which at this point is already winning, because he has an extra passed pawn. But instead he goes rook to b6 and just tries to exploit the fact that black's pieces are so disorganized. Uh, king to c6, there. So with rooks on, uh, the pawn advances very fast. Finally black wants to activate his bishop um, but, and attack the pawn, but Fisher doesn't really care about this. He just wants to promote the pawn. So he blocks the, the rook from controlling the queening square and just goes bishop b8. Now a6, a7, a8 queen is a threat. 
rook c8, the pawn advances. He takes, and now he wants to play something like rook a3 to at least guard the queening square. Here, Fischer could have won very quickly with the rook d6. And after this, he threatens both to trade off the rooks and to win the bishop. Uh, in the game, he played um, something else. He played rook to b5. But after this, he won the game anyway. Uh, the rooks are off, and now he could win the bishop by advancing the pawn, but instead he goes bishop to e5, and there's no way to prevent the pawn from advancing. So it's a very instructive game from Fischer, where he shows the development of pieces is more important than the pawn weaknesses in some positions.